My name is Jeff Bonfort. Today, I'd like to share with you uh, my most recent book uh, called Messenger's Tattoo and Other Stories. This is a collection of very, very short fiction of what it's like to teach in a maximum security prison. Uh, when I went to work uh, every day, I would take a notes of a uh, recording uh, on paper, basically the most interesting thing that happened or something uh, uh, interesting that I had heard from inmates or staff. And I uh, put the puzzle together, so to speak. I constructed a story about that. Everything that happened in the prison uh, is kind of like the paints that a painter uses. And I tried to paint uh, a whole bunch of uh, uh, short 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 stories about a fictionalized account of what it's like to teach in a maximum security prison i taught at the prison for 15 years and before that i was a teacher in korea and japan and i have taught in uh american high schools also i don't know how i managed to pull it off but i made a living teaching for about 30 years so so that's there's something to be said for that but let me begin with the dedication. Uh, these stories are dedicated to victims of crime everywhere, including staff and inmates of all prisons in all places. And I'd like to read to you a few quotes from some of the characters out of this book. This is from Cajun Gager, a convicted felon. He's off paper. What's it like doing time? Grab a stranger from the street and live in your bathroom with him. Eat, sleep, do everything in there. Try that for a couple of years. And just to make it interesting, have your new buddy be more nuts than you are. This is, here's another one from inmate Resser. Fear of prison never stopped a man from doing anything. People like me don't ever think about what they are doing. We just do it. And this is from Lucy S. She's a victim. Lock them up and keep them locked up. It's the only way to keep us safe from those monsters. I know. I've been raped and left for dead by a guy out on parole. And this is from inmate Core. We never went to school. We could do what we wanted. There was always a party at our house all day and all night. My mom was pretty for a while. And here's one from a correctional officer. Man, you don't know what stress is. Coworkers, inmates, administrators, even John Q. Public, they all want to get you at the same time all the time. And this is one from Betty Aiming. She's a correctional officer. When we had the union, we had input deciding how things would go. But the squirrels don't like that. The squirrels throughout this book, by the way, are kind of the a nickname for the uh, the authority the man if you will when we had a union we had input deciding how things would go but the squirrels don't like that here is the truth take away administration nothing bad happens take away teachers nothing bad happens take away the correctional officers and you've got dead people on the floor shouldn't we have a say in how we make this place safe for everyone and here's a quote from a teacher, Eddie Macker, who says, it's not the inmates, staff makes you crazy. Me, thought of killing others and myself only briefly. And this is from Warden Ed Smythe. He says, corrections is a good step for someone with ambition. It can also be your ending. You must be careful if you want to advance. Hell, you got to be careful if you want to stay where you are. And those were just a few quotes from some of the characters out of here. Uh, I think next I would like to read the prologue, which will kind of uh, 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 give you a 
uh, perspective as to where this this uh, uh, collection is coming from. All my students live with another man in a cell furnished with sink, toilet, and two iron bunks, which are bolted to a concrete wall. There is a small desk and a chair. These are bolted to the concrete floor. Some cells have windows. It is hot in the summer and cold in the winter, a seasonal abode. But some cells stay hot all the time and conflict strikes with the surprise and swiftness of a thunderstorm. These short fictions are about those people who spend most of their lives on the hidden side of the walls and razor wire, enduring the realities of kept and keeper, where the threat of violence roils just beneath everybody's skin. I have tried to create a reality where human relationships might evolve into something more than staff watching inmates do their time and inmates watching staff so they can run illegal enterprises. There must be a middle somewhere. I celebrate the place where we are the same. A Native American inmate said that to me a long time ago. If you have the guts to get along with unpleasant people, it holds true. In corrections, if you don't have that kind of dedication or foolishness in your DNA, you should stay home. Legislators, courts, inmates, and staff all work in tandem to keep the caged life going. A strange timeshare inside a very crowded, secluded world. Where going to work isn't going to work, it's going to life. And I would begin with the I'll begin with the first actual uh, uh, little story here. It's called Another Lockdown. No inmate movement, an assault, a death. Maybe the secret squirrels found something and they wanted to find more. School is canceled. Some teachers are deputized for the kitchen. A white shirted squirrel reassigns me to the prison laundry. Eight o'clock Monday morning. I grab some light reading for downtime between loads and get over there. I'm told by the laundry sergeant to round up dirty clothes from the housing units. Full laundry carts as big as cars await me. I sail across the courtyard with a cargo of fermenting clothes, come about, grab an empty cart and tack through the wind to another housing unit and exchange the empty cart for a full one. I power it back to the laundry and tie up where we put on rubber gloves and begin washing. We feed clothes into a monster machine, slam the door and stand back. Not like at home, boy. I don't have any time for reading. Between loads, I help the sergeant sew name tags and inmate numbers on pants and shirts, making sure they match. We talked a little, sharing our disappointment with the union. He told me hunting stories. I told him fishing stories. The lockdown is over before noon. Inmate workers are allowed to leave their housing units and report to institutional jobs. I can retire from the laundry business. The names on shirts, pants, and everything else I labeled are reunited with their owners. Later, in my garage converted to a classroom classroom, I explain the magic to be found in verb tense, the prediction we've heard all of our lives. It's going to get better. And this next one is called Too Many Cards and Letters. The Secret Squirrel Club again struck without warning. Modified lockdown. Minimal inmate movement. No school. All teachers reported to the visitor lobby for reassignment. Modified lockdown meant that the squirrels wouldn't order us to get work in the laundry or the kitchen. We'll find something else for you to do. We sat in the soft blue chairs and crossed our legs waiting for one of the squirrels to come in and get us going. You might be sent to inmate property or the mail room or told to help file medical records at health services. Once I inventoried toilet paper and bars of soap inside the deep canyons of the prison warehouse for eight hours. By the end of the day, my head was splitting and I smell like a flower. Sometimes the warden himself showed up to direct the show, but usually a crisp, polished white shirt skipped into the lobby, armed with a clipboard and professional smile. 
Everything is great. Just ask me. Captain Helio handed me a pen and a clipboard of forms and sent me to the housing unit, sent me to housing unit one, where teams of blue shirts had started cell searches. I sat on the other side of the steel table from cuffed inmates and recorded any contraband found in their cells. I, I signed off on the contraband. It was like absolution. Going through a guy's personal photos bothers me. Pictures of kids make me feel sorry and shots of nude wives and girlfriends both shames and fascinates me. The images of these women stays in my mind for days. In a far off place, someone hopes they are remembered by another man for a much longer time. Uh, this next one is called Suicide Before a Second Cup. I set my lunch bag on the conveyor belt, watching the x-ray machine swallow it whole. I listened to a new sergeant as she stared it into my sandwich and banana that trembled across her computer screen. Guy on unit one hung himself last night, she said. Staff or inmate? Not funny. The conveyor belt stopped, stopped conveying. I gestured to the sergeant. She nodded. My Launched my arms like a cat. You can't help but speculate if you knew the guy who did himself in. We all got the email. Gomez was taken to the hospital and pronounced dead. But no one dies in prison. Not, at, not until after that ride to the hospital. They die there. And this next one is, is called Earthquakes what they can do. Most of the staff here is white and most of the inmates black. It charges the fault line between the keepers and the kept with a kind of electricity, a force that wants to run loose on both ends. Inmate Harelli is an old lifer. He will die here. He asked about the American Civil War. The North was against slavery, right? Lincoln, they won, right? They freed the slaves, they were the good guys. Yeah, I say. Why do we have earthquakes? Pressure across the Earth's crust, I say, like a guy who's wound up too tight. He's going to snap. He nods his head. We got plenty of them around here. Make a fist. Pirelli's dark face opens in surprise as if he's moved his hand for the first time in his life. I ball my own fist and meet his big knuckles. Push, push hard. I shift my fist. Our mutual force veers beside us. We just made an earthquake. What we did with our fist happens under the ground, except on a much bigger scale. Kind of like the earth in a battle with itself. Pirelli frowns. Maybe it's like me. I battle with myself all the time. That's why I'm in here. The wrong side won. Ha ha. Waves of zen and buckets and empty space chase through my head, and I thank them for it. This next one is called A Visible Success. Inmate Nairobi Abdua nearly flew out of his desk. Other students now stood and stared through the security window. What's so interesting in the hallway? Pretty a pretty black lady with a nice booty. The entire class stiffened. Black administrators and correctioners are rare as rain in the desert. A black woman? Double. She smiled at us and came inside my classroom, a warm handshake, soft and friendly. My students sat stone still in a strained male hunger heated a silence that gave everyone vertigo. She recognized a book from my shelf. Her perfect teeth lit up her face like candles on a chocolate birthday cake as her smile became even bigger. Grammar on grammar, I love that book. Have any of you men used it? My students all spoke at once, trying to explain how helpful they found a book none had ever seen, much less open. It seems your teacher makes good use of materials on hand, she said. That's good. He's the best teacher they got, Abadua said. Yesterday, I thought he wanted to strangle me. There was no need to thank our visitor. That's why she got the big money. This next one is called 
occasional cucumber. The sandwich my wife made me was a, was a produce department squeezed between two slices of, of whole wheat bread. Any meat in there, inmate guy asked, or just, uh, uh, what was I? Guy often forgot what he was talking about. Life had been very tough on Guy's head. You're early, Mr. Guy. I don't like eating in front of inmates, but you might as well have a look. Oh, may I? I opened the sandwich like a book, as if the lettuce, tomato, and sprouts might tell a story. I do an awful lot. Who? Whoever made your sandwich. If they put all that stuff in your sandwich, plus mayo and the occasional sliced cucumber, it means that they, uh, you know, it means something. You sound like an expert in sandwich making. I made a million sandwiches for my brothers and sisters. Never like that, though. The conversation seemed to sharpen them up, pull them in from somewhere. I grew up on state peanut butter, you know, them big aluminum tins. No crunchy style, only smooth. You add the occasional cucumber to your peanut butter sandwich, and then you got something good. The kids stopped complaining for a while. Don't bring it up. The bread is too dry. This next one is called Weeds in the Tower. Two frowning men frequently mistaken for an odd looking set of twins were Pete Weed and his son Douglas. The Weed men instigated confrontation. They believed it was part of their job description, the w a way to handle dangerous men. Let them know just who the hell was the boss. Who could blame them? Physical force has always been an effective tool in controlling populations. Each weed enthusiastically worked the segregation units, exchanging blows with the toughest inmates in the prison. They didn't work together often, but when paired up, they came on like two wild cards in a no limit poker game. High or low, which way you want to go? When inmates heard one of the weeds ask this, their bowels shifted a bit. Officers weed and weed stood together comparing duty assignments from a list posted outside the captain's office. Both suddenly shouted congratulations. The weeds would be watching for escape attempts from the elevated climbs of the South Tower. They had never drawn tower duty before. On paper, tower duty was every CO's dream post. But dreams fade when you open your eyes. What do you do up there for eight hours? It would drive me nuts, many CO's said. A reporter from the local newspaper, <clears throat> excuse me, found familial uh, inspiration in the weeds and wrote a feature on the father-son team who kept the community safe from their glass a strong dad and a good son combining their sworn duties and how it drew them closer. An American story. The weeds were permanently assigned to the towers. I grinned at the gastric relief Segrats must have felt after hearing of the weeds' new posting and praying they might fall out of their tower and break their necks. They didn't and they wouldn't. But they did make the newspaper later that year because they opened fire with state shotguns at geese flying over the prison. Father and son brought down a couple. Uh, this next one is is messenger's tattoo. This is this is kind of the this this is the the also the uh, title the uh, title of the book actually. This is the one that I chose to represent the book. Messenger's tattoo. My students seemed to be occupied with something more than gambling for candy bars. They were inspired. Inmates bounced across the yard as if their bones had been lubed. The tower blue shirt said, the kids looked too happy on their way to school. What were they up to? The alert sounded not with shouts or sirens, but via an email urging staff to remain vigilant. Report anything that looks suspicious. The mystery soon cleared. An enterprising inmate clerk at Psych Services had laminated a hundred or so pornographic pictures and distributors on the housing units. The porn showed up at school where it was rented by horny inmates, paying anything from coffee to dope for a chance to go on a hot date 
with a photo in their hand. Inmate Messenger had a better idea. He wanted a lifetime partner, someone accessible, a woman who would satisfy his needs on demand and console him during the dark and lonely nights in his cell. They did a nice job on her face, I said. She looks pretty. Yeah, he sighed. Dude's tattoo gun was confiscated. Well, half a girl is better than no girl. I disagreed, momentarily forgetting where we were. This next one is called Smurfs. SMU, the Special Medications Unit. There were a few fights on Housing Unit 6. Most altercations limited to slapping and scratching. Guys with green teeth and greasy hair, droolers. Men too soft and too slow to live in general population filled the cells of SMU. Smurfs just didn't have it in them to sharpen their fighting skills or much else. I supervised the ice cream cart detail going to the housing units where we sold ice cream on wheels. Profits went to local charities. My two workers came from Unit 6. The thrill of the cell passed easily into the heads of these very excitable ice cream merchants. An officer opened the door to housing Unit 2 without a word. He didn't like the program. He's a crank, Down said. Yeah, a crank, said Epps. Come on, men. We came here to sell ice cream, not to make friends. I got a lot of friends already, Down said. Me too. Inmate Johnson, the biggest and most dangerous man in the institution, stood first in line. I mistook the pink punch card in his hand for an extra finger. All day room traffic flowed smoothly around him like a big rock in a creek. He asked for two pints of blueberry dervish with sweet sugar nuts. Only Smurfs are allowed to laugh, and we did. This one is called Letter from Eve. The yellowed paper between the pages of an old GED text reminded me of a pressed leaf, one of those school projects for kids. To save something pretty, a letter. Somebody broke the rules. Inmates cannot bring personal items to class. Would security still think it was toxic? I began reading. It came from a typewriter. Dear Dad, I can't write no more. My new man, who is my husband, don't want me writing no felon like you because it don't look right and it should work out different. Maybe I can send you a Christmas card sometime. Love your daughter, Eve. I carefully slipped the letter back into the book. Imagining that some ailing, stooped superfly still waited for a Christmas card from his daughter. I didn't have to imagine any farther than the next class. We had quite a few guys like that. Now, this next story is called Frog. I wonder the why of a thing. The great spanned the pit where the drain collected rainwater during floods just outside the back of my classroom. Once in a while, I stood on it, watching clouds or waiting for weather. It was a good place to watch fronts roll in. Directly under me, a frog sat in a dark corner 15 feet down. He hopped the perimeter of his new home. Very little water and nothing to eat down there. He didn't seem to like it much. <clears throat> Excuse me. Searching for a way out. I kept the pit damp. I dropped dead flies through the grate. Inmates help collect them. If this frog could handle the solitude, it might be a good life. We kept track of him every day, pouring a few glasses of water into the pit and dousing him with dead flies. One morning I came in with a big green spider. It was too late for water or spiders. Failed to cope with his loneliness. Six months later, the frog had mummified to a crisp. A year after that, he became invisible. Another unreported prison evaporation. I should have at least named that frog. We should have done something. Okay, uh, this next one is called Back on the Corner. The secret squirrels attempted to reduce lawsuits thrown at officers who gave inmates the wrong meds. It was easy to give a man the wrong meds. 
There were a lot of meds and inmates tried tripping officers up to create a chance at a lawsuit. The going settlement was 3,000 bucks. Inmates now walked to health services and waited for a frazzled nurse to dispense the drugs through a barred window while an officer or two looked on. Did it make inmates homesick hanging around the corner waiting for dope? I would have laughed like hell at that joke before teaching at the prison. When a load of popcorn worth more than my car once filled my back seat, it was to raise money for high school band uniforms. This next one is entitled Lovers of Inmates. With a little refurbishing, you'll be able to return that chair to your living room, but for now it is ruined and has to stay hidden in the basement. At the end of the day, I pass visitors waiting to see inmates. The little kids are the little kids anywhere. They make noise and beg for treats. Young women look angry in their fixed straight ahead stare. Mothers and grandmothers have left their dreams at an address they've long ago forgotten. They smile and are polite. They don't have enough time left in their lives for rudeness. At home, I put fault and fear in front of the TV until the commercials take it all away. Where this one is called venting. I don't think there's anything wrong with a rant, Mr. Todd said. If you have, if you have one away from inmates and none of the secret squirrels are around. I felt better after talking with him. We all know this place can drive you crazy, he said. Thanks. The silence embarrassed me. I felt like I had something else to say. I couldn't get a job anywhere. Teaching at a prison was the last stop. Before what, he asked. Don't worry, I laughed. Not suicide or anything like that. But it had been there. I remembered a shadow which had no distinct features, an evil thought without thought a thing staring at me that finally moved on like a predator, unable to eat anything more. Harmless, now that it was full. Okay, this, this one is called Old TV Show. So, who do you like the best? Little Joe Hoss or Adam? I wanted inmate Hernandez to write a few paragraphs in preparation for the GED test. He didn't want to write anything. He wanted a GED certificate without doing the work re required to get it. He said, Hoss, this was my opening. Hernandez began writing about Hoss Cartwright. The drug thug from Texas was writing about a cowboy TV character from a show three times. It lit up a teaching moment, a time when I have tripped the switch, stepped on the cat, hit the button, turned on the water, and reeled in, and reeled in the fish. I blurted to Hernandez that my sister liked Adam and how we shared big bowls of popcorn in a darkened living room with the only light coming from the TV and the red glow of our parents' cigarettes. He almost spoke, thought it over, and kept writing about Hoss Cartwright. I like writing with literature when it goes full gallop. Okay, this is called Spoiled. When infinity gets as friendly as your finger, I love this prison, inmate Dragani says. You get pancakes with syrup plus a glass of juice, and nobody tries to kill you while you sleep. You got hassles, but everybody gets hassles. I kept quiet. Dragani would never leave the institution. He had too many violent felonies. He had created too much devastation on the outside to ever get back out there. Dragani, our model inmate, reminding us that breakfast is the most important meal of the day. It popped out of his mouth like toast from a toaster before he could say good morning. Here's one called Complaint Department. Inmate Littletown tells me he can't use the textbooks in my class. Dust. These books be dusty. Shit gets all, all up. A poet might say dusty books mean dusty heads but GED administrators cut poetry from the test after discovering its real world irre irrelevance. At last rescued from thousands of years of literary folly, the search for meaning is called off. It goes unclaimed, its metaphysical world banned. I read poetry to my classes. I listen to rap. 
that can't miss stuff that will last as long as we do. This, this one is called paint. We had a big painting project in the prison and the inmates uh, volunteered to the, uh, actually uh, uh, quite uh, skilled painters paint. The squirrels awarded my classroom Dakota wheat. I imagined waves of a great golden crop flowing with the western winds and how the fields would look on the walls that refused to be anything but brick, no matter how hard I looked. Inmate Kant talked about the prison paint project. It's good. How'd you like to look at those same old walls for the rest of your life? A different color gives us a new perspective, new spiritual possibilities in our lives. It takes a dedicated imagination to see possibility in those bricks, I said. Kant's disappointment smeared the drying paint. Possibility in bricks? No, man, bricks will forever be bricks. But the paint, it's in the paint, the paint man. He stepped back, painting the air with his hand. Maybe he was conducting an orchestra or sewing. He'd be right. Of course, it's in the paint. Dakota wheat. Ah. Okay. I'm just kind of skipping around here. I. There's, uh, it, it's as you can see, it's, it's a pretty, it's a pretty thick book. So I've got a lot of choices to choose from here this morning. Uh, this is called detergent. The Secret Squirrel Club smashed the inmate laundry racket. Laundry men hoarding state detergent and selling it cheap to fellow inmates who used the housing unit's washing machine to wash their personal clothes were out of a job. Their income had vanished. After inmates Miller and Ora returned from a month in SEG, they told a story of greed, overpricing, and snitchery. How to engineer a business failure. We kept too much in stock. We raised prices. It was a big mistake. Our creative business tactics, tactics got wrong dude's attention. We got ratted on. The shirts knew exactly where we kept the soap. How they know if nobody tells them? The squirrels tried extinguishing the flames of underground capitalism, but it was like trying to put out a grass fire without water. They had to jump all over the place. There are always buyers of the stolen and new, inside the joint and out. This one is called Beats Roofing. Loads of correctional officers quit the DOC after state legislators outlawed collective bargaining and ripped the guts out of our union. Shortage of security staff resulted in prison programs running every other day. We taught GED classes two or three days a week. Look busy, make lesson plans, invent work. Our union is gone. I watched Japanese war films on my computer and wept at the predicament of those poor people. Teaching felons how to read and write still beats the hell out of roofing houses for a living. Home building is a bruising occupation. Okay, I'm gonna try this. This one might be a bit longer, but not much. I specifically tried to make these very short. I've always been a kind of a fan of Ezra Pound uh, I, 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 I couldn't quite get a lot of his writing, but I really, I really dig what he says about writing. And he said, make it new. And that's, that's kind of what I tried to do here by making these so short. Anyway, this is called Shows Gets His Guts Fixed. The Secret Squirrel Club believes inmate shows regularly gets dope into the prison. Inmate shows is my GED tutor. I hired him for many applicants for the job. We work together every day. And every day he complains about pain in his stomach. Officer Rex stops shows in the hall leading to my classroom. Shows, you are intoxicated. She pivoted to me. You didn't notice? He looks the same as he always does. My students envied shows trip to the local hospital for a blood test. Any outside trip meant real food and a chance to be near women. Shows returned that afternoon. The toxicology report was negative. This made Rec angry. 
but the good doctors followed the bacteria in his blood all the way to his liver, and that's why he had been sick for the past two years. The prison clinic had misdiagnosed it as chronic stomach gas. New, new medication immediately made him feel better. I'm glad Wreck is such a bitch. She probably saved my life. What did you have in the cafeteria? I asked. I felt so happy they found out what was wrong with me that I didn't think about lunch. He didn't mention nurses, and there's nothing wrong with that. Okay, here's, ah, there's the nub. Mr. Knott, the new education director, arrived as a royal. He wanted us to call him Duke. The new agenda included his declaration that inmates were stealing too many pencils from our classrooms. He enlightened us with not so profound administrative logic. No nub, no pencil, one-to-one -one exchange only. My classroom was nubless. I never saved them, nobody did. Nubs? This pissed me off. Send me your huddled nubs yearning to write free, I shouted to my students. Word got around and by day's end, I had a good hundred or so nubs that lay scattered over my desk like nails. The Duke struck quickly, calling me into the education office. You collected how many? Serene, his secretary, stirred her Mountain Dew with a frosted donut. Snitch. I told my guys to make it a team effort and gather up pencil nubs. We don't encourage inmates to use teamwork. Do you know what organized resistance is? You are encouraging unity, he said. I just needed some pencils. What do you say, Serene? I got lots of nubs. One for one, right? Looks like you guys owe me some pencils. She stared into her Mountain Dew. Duke? Give him an exchange rate of one pencil for five nubs. I nearly called him Duke, and I almost said thanks. Okay, this one is called Inmate Carl's Makeover. Inmate Carl was a 30-year-old white guy doing 20 years for molesting kids. His new world of gangs, meth kooks, and murderers demanded a change of ID because if inmates discovered his real crimes, He'd be ambushed, beaten down, maybe killed before the end of the day. SOS, smash on sight. Carl heard the story of using a hammer on a guy's legs until the bones turned to mush. After that, they stuck plastic forks in his eyes. In the prison universe, he lived as an unlucky bank robber who nervously gave away canteen items to the heavy hitters on the housing unit, a generosity might start a network of powerful friends. He especially paid attention to his new cellmate. Tell me again how they got you, Nash asked. Carl avoided a detailed account of the imagined robbery. He said a snitch turned him in, and what he'd do to that snitch if he ever got his hand on him. Carl ran hot water into the sink for some instant coffee. Cream, sugar? How many times I gotta tell you? I'm black. I drink black coffee. You think I'd ever put anything white inside of me? After their coffee, Mesh tried showing Carl it was the other way around. Carl's screams brought a team of blue shirts. Inmate.com quickly picked up the details of the story because it happened near the end of the first shift. The officers howled about having to stay late to complete their reports. Sexual assaults always drew a lot of attention. Carl, the secret tree jumper, survived another day. Mesh was taken to Seg. Alone in his cell, Carl cried for his mother and wrote her a letter. He missed her more than he missed kids. She would be happy to hear her boy was making progress. They hadn't had much of that around home. Okay, this one is called uh, War Maker. War Maker. The waiting of his life was like wind. He never knew when or why. It just came on, suddenly embracing inmate Haas and whispering, keep trying. Butterflies hatched along the walls of was being crazily into his throat, becoming a sky-filled migration into the clouds. He wished he could go along. After the butterflies left, he felt nothing. Not the walls, bars in his window, not even the floor. He evolved into his own flag, a private nation of one, a perfect inmate. 
It took two years for a unit manager to notice. The Secret Squirrel Club abruptly claimed inmate Haas's great attitude was the result of their professionalism and a new behavior modification technique. Haas didn't know any of that. He just waited for the right wind to breeze into his cell and give him the whisper. Okay. Uh, this one is called Wannabe Cheerleader. I secretly root for the convicted murderer who is on a hunger strike. Inmate Lace. His spotty academic success remains a splintered work in progress on account of his frequent flyer miles to and from the SEG unit. I know of two, but I've only met the one inmate Lace. The other guy I don't know at all, the monster. Lace tells me the meds he takes keeps the monster. Like the apple and the doctor, he said. A new psychiatrist takes him off his meds, which steers Lace straight into the boom boom room. He sits, he sits naked on a plastic mattress, baking under the eternal fluorescent lights. Pleased to meet you, Steve Lace. I'm Steve Lace. A lifetime of unpleasant companionship. I hope Lace can get his meds back and start living alone again. One of them sent me a kite saying he wishes the same thing. This one is called Candy Song. The new education director insisted we follow the school handbook, which prohibited inmates from having candy at school. A guy could hide something in the wrapper or pass information. The candy rule had never been enforced. We had survived untouched. I only got on anyone about it if there were wrappers left on my classroom floor. This new enforcement of candy rules pissed off the inmates. A few already had been written up. Inmate Lucino came to class with cheeks so full he couldn't speak. Brown juice leaked from the corners of his mouth. He hummed the battle hymn of the Republic. He smiled and wiped his mouth with his wrist. Want one? He held out a candy bar and began humming again. The school pass officer came in. Come on, Lucky, let's go back to the housing unit. Move now. He hummed all the way out of, out of the school. This time it sounded like the Marines hymn. Always a catchy tune. Uh, this is called Safety First. I dreamily wondered, did the local high school football team play their homecoming game tonight? A mumble of movement outside my house kept me awake. Thoughts piled on a makeshift nightmare, half formed and dimly lit. In an episode of Freudian funk, I'm an inmate. A blurred cellmate steals my canteen, goes through my locker, running his semen smeared fingers over my personals. That noise. Someone was out there in the backyard. Duty and dream compelled me to investigate and protect my property. The wet grass chilled my bare feet and the bottoms of my pajamas were soaked after a few, step, after a few steps. A mile of toilet paper hung like noodles over the trees and roof. I heard the quiet, soft-souled escape of four or five kids running through the darkness. It was important. I heard them laughing as they made their escape. Having your home toilet papered is not a life or death thing. It is merely an angry issue. There's no need for the gun. This one is called joke. When inmate Marion said that he and his sons knew Mein Kampf, I asked if they had read it together. Then I asked if they had worn uniforms. Yeah, but it's expensive. The kids grow up so fast. We were lucky because the boys' birthdays were far enough apart so we could use the hand-me-downs until they stopped growing. By that time, I told all three of them they had to buy their own. What happened to the old uniforms, I asked. We kept them for the younger kids. Do you miss those times when you guys got all spiffed up and marched around? Ah, some. But uniforms don't mean shit. I, I learned that here. This suit I got on don't come close to defining me. You have to look through the uniform to see the man. I did, and that was the trouble. Properties. It's a small window in my upstairs bathroom, but the vantage point provides a good view. Two boys about eight years old face off in the alley that runs behind the garage. From the window, I can see things down there begin to escalate. Their voices rise and fall with the rhythms of argument. I don't like your attitude. 
The shoving begins and each boy ends with errant punches across some very surprised lips and they separate, each horrified at the warm blood in their mouths. The boys run for their lives to where each can find love and safety. In prison, there is more blood and not much of the other. This one is called Past. P-A-S-T, as in the past. I didn't think we'd ever see inmate walks in school again. He'd been transferred to a supermax following his attack on a rec officer. The officer quit with a loss of vision in one eye. Staff here thought wax, uh, staff here thought walks might be swallowed for good by the system and that we'd never have to deal with him again. He stood in front of me as a changed man, not as changed as the officer. This time I want to stay out of trouble and get my GED. You won't have no trouble for me. Just tell me what to do. Dark scars blistered on a dark face as if he'd slipped coins under his skin. A tooth was gone. A wrinkled scalp sagged over his dented skull as a dozen spots of dry skin followed brushy islands of curly gray hair. He smelled like bad water, no different than anyone else who forgets to shower. I assigned an essay, write about a pleasant memory. He struggled. Does it have to be something good? Pleasant, you know, fun. Something that makes you feel good. Not something you thought made you feel good? That was one of my big mistakes. Write about that if you want. Mistakes? Write about mistakes? Sure. What the hell for? A change man asked. This one is called How It Is Now. Management across the state jumped out of their swivel chairs following the latest round of mass shootings across the country. It could happen here tomorrow. It could happen anywhere. The squirrels held administrative meetings and put together conference calls, confided with each other, and collected enough data needed to launch SCAB, Stop Criminal Acts Before. The decision to name the program SCAB had gone back and forth over the oak table inside a soft, quiet conference room. SCAB? Are we sure? Stop criminal acts be before? Are we staying with that? Squirrel One wanted to know. I like to end the violence in our lives. Sounds like a movie title, Squirrel Two said. Evil? Come on, guys, Squirrel Three scolded. He's right. It can't be evil. We can't call it evil, decided Squirrel One. They gave SCAB a green light. Scab speakers traveled to all the state prisons. Our presenter advised us to pay close attention to mood swings in people. Don't be shy. In a polite, professional way, ask if someone is okay. Someone going through tough times? Somebody acting overly stressed? These are things we need to know. Stop criminal activity before? Before what? The acronym left staff confused, but my head was clear. They killed our union. Scab was totally appropriate. Okay, this is called Snow is Snow Anywhere. I look over the tattooed natives populating the landscape of my prison classroom, suspicious because they are so quiet. I can hear the heat flowing from a register. What are these killers and molesters up to? Why are they looking out of the windows? Something calms me and I, I can't figure it out. I'm following inmates to the window. Someone has unzipped the clouds. It sure is pretty when it snows. Half the schools in the state have a snow day. Businesses close. A weather emergency is declared. We have no snow days at the prison. Only snow day sensations. This is called melancholy. From across the classroom, inmate crash shouts. I mean, could you be more specific and quit yelling? He painfully spells it out. How many times in his life has he wanted something and didn't give in until he made someone so crazy that they finally caved? Is it twisted or sincere dedication to focus so deeply into yourself that you can't take anybody's no for an answer? The kid knows how to make the world vanish. This is a very good thing. Crass is 19 doing life. Melancholy, I say. Melancholy, he repeats, chewing his mint gum. It, it means to be a little sad, like the blues. Well, then why don't they just say sad? 
Crass has not taken his eyes off the word. Like this weather today, I continue. A little sad. Ain't nothing wrong with this weather, he says, still not looking up from the word. I said it reminded I said the weather reminded me of a funeral. You ever kill anyone, Crass asked. Silently, I, I failed to salvage anything. Then what you know about funerals and weather, huh? What you know about any funerals? He's looking at me hard. I'm just one lucky son of a bitch, I said. Don't know anything about funerals. He respected me a bit more after that. I could feel it. This one is called test. Inmate Egan's biceps turned into baseballs every time he moved his arms. He stayed to himself, sweating over GED material and speed reading Western novels. People on the outside mailed him a book or so every week. His offer to donate these books to the prison library was rejected as per the security director. Egan's cell would be cluttered with books and the squirrels called to cart them away. Rumored they were burned. His body shouted for, a, for physical activity, ready to explode into a run or a leap. Raw athletic power shamed the baggy prison greens he'd be wearing until he died. Every time I saw him, I imagined a pair of football pads on his shoulder, or basketball in his hands. He liked knitting, another solitary pastime, easily tolerating the ironic nature of his delicate hobby because his size and crimes committed kept fellow inmates at a distance. Staff feared him too. He told me that I passed his test. Not interested. You treat me like a human being, he continued. I joked it was simply my winning personality and good looks and vast wealth, I added. Let's not leave that out. Past his test, more like my test. Okay, this one is called Dr. Google. Inmate Mitz returned to school after prostate surgery with a catheter in his pants and a collection bag under his shirt. My piss looks like cherry Kool-Aid. His panic reached places that I kept from inmates, personal locations where even I did not travel. I try not to think about too much shit. I Googled his symptoms. A little pink is normal, it says. I know what red is. Red blood. I shot two men and I know what the hell red blood looks like. I said, drink more water. The next day, it was pink. I hit it right. Dr. Google, healer of felons. Okay, this one is called team. Suddenly, it's important to get along with your coworkers. The presenters enthusiastically asked a room full of blue shirts and non-uniform staff to reveal something about themselves that might, surpri might surprise coworkers. A creeping panic tickled my spine. I sell lingerie as a sideline, somebody said. I have two pit bulls. I used to be a carny. My turn crept nearer like cue lines in a play. I, felt, I fell into a pool of stage fright. I was drowning. She skipped me. My sudden anonymity felt like a tailored shirt, and I looked good. Call whiteboard. Political lines between evil and good had been so clearly drawn that men who couldn't spell vote were now watching political news as closely as they watched football. The growing deterioration of the country's leadership grabbed students' interests like a game slipping into overtime. What they mean, the right and the left. I marched to the whiteboard armed with eraser and markers. I listed, labeled, and drew big circles for 20 minutes. If you go right far enough you go and you go left far enough, both link up here. Societies without borders, laws, or armies. In its most extreme form, the eventual location of virtually every political faction, if allowed to run a full theoretical development, is a place of extinction. The guy stared as if I had stepped out of the wall. Hey, it's Friday, I said. All jokes must go, I said, stealing a line from Jay Leno. At least they shook their heads at me. This is really isn't so fictional. This is simply called Notes on Prison Stories. The affinity between the imprisoned and the free has always been part of our collective mythology. It's biblical. 
and most other religious texts instruct us to care about the man or woman who is on the run from authorities, guilty or not. Seeing the incarcerated, seeing the incarcerated in people an obligation to provide assistance and sometimes rescue, it is natural to feel sorry for someone sitting in jail. Is it because we haven't been their victim, haven't seen the things they've done? Is that what constructs the emotional void needed for us to sympathize with those who have done the hurting? If I can't distance myself from inmates, I'm not allowed to teach in prison. I must gain inmates' trust and respect without truly giving any back. Is that what I do all day? Yes and no. What I give to students feels genuine, and yet it must not be genuine. What does that make me? A hypocrite? A professional? They say clothes don't make the man. What about a guy in a blaze orange jumpsuit standing in a chow line? Or someone in a blue shirt drawing their keys and body alarm at 7.45 in the morning? I notice that the sleeves on my shirt are too frayed to wear to work. You go, girl and boy, is what I say. We're back in more of the fictional mode here. Uh, this one is called Advice from One. I don't go to work when I'm sick. That's why we have sick days. And sometimes I stay home when I feel fine. A gesture of resistance. I get spooked thinking about making the call. Will I sound sick? What will I say exactly? Which secret squirrel will pick up the phone? Will I arouse their suspicions? I roll to work next morning and say hello to a couple of blue shirts. I draw my keys, body alarm, and find myself looking into the face of a man doing life for a double murder who is asking me for a pencil. With an eraser on it, he says. Here come the rest of the men. They take their seats. Inmate Smith has finished an essay. Never trust a woman who goes by two first names. I liked it already. Anderby quietly starts a new rap, whispering a new song to himself. Someone says, if it ain't foreign, it's got to be born. Travel appeals to both staff and on the way out, on the way home, but never coming in. This is called unopened bread and cereal. Food is always disputed property. You can share it. It's the most popular thing to trade or steal. The gratification is immediate. Some men prefer American noodles over imported noodles. These fiber patriots believe in the USA's wheat like good kids believe in their good moms. Inmates discover that the institution's noodles are imported from South Korea. A few guys start a hunger strike. Hunger shears a man's will like wool off a sheep, turns him naked, causes stupidity, sunken cheeks and a shiny face. The odor of failure goes through the tears like the stink of a backed up pipe. The kitchen workers start cooking. The smells of hot grease and strong coffee take over. For the hunger strikers, where noodles come from doesn't matter anymore. It's not long before inmates smell bacon and eggs and goodness again. Some guys just have cereal. If they don't believe all of the food. This one is called Goodbye Wally. I sat with folded hands at a substance abuse group, SAG. Graduation held in the visitor's lobby. One of the grads was an ex-student who had passed the language arts section of the GED a few months ago. If Waldorf stayed out of trouble, he would, be in the, he would be on the streets in a few weeks. The guest speaker said only a few people in the room would be successful in maintaining a prolonged sobriety and life without drug abuse. Most eventually fail and die under the influence. Waldor did not take this information well. I knew him, and when he began swinging his arms and rocking his shoulders, it always meant he was coming unglued. I, grad, I grabbed some props and got over to him as fast as I could. I assured him that he had a better chance than anyone and wished him the best of luck over coffee and an excellent chocolate chip cookie I handed him. Later in the week, Waldor was randomly drug tested. I didn't ask. Too damn many whys. I wanted to think of him as Wally on his way home, 
early in the morning on a sunny day. This one is called Toilet Wars. I heard the staff snitches talking about me. He uses the inmate toilet sometimes. He does? I step inside the teacher's lounge. Yes, I does, I say. It's a stand, a blow for freedom, a statement against tyranny, an expression of protest cleaned three times a day by the school custodian and is 10 feet from my classroom door. I sit comfortably in mid commode 15 minutes before classes begin. Wisdom often visits during my denounced privacy. Most great social movements begin that way. This is called Resurrections. My students complained. The movies shown throughout the prison on the institutional channel sucked. We ain't kids, we is men. Know what we get? Shows about dogs and shit. And freaking cartoons. I suggested they write down what they wanted. What they wanted right now more than anything. They must not have heard me correctly or they took my suggestion literally. Had I subconsciously meant to be literal? No movie titles came in, not a single title. I got wishes. Some guys wanted money, some to make love with a woman. A few asked for weed. Most wanted somebody to come back from the dead. A simple resurrection, please. So, Here's the epilogue. This is this is the immediately after uh, the resurrection story. I finished the final story of this collection today, Resurrections. For me, the story's placement and message is obvious. I think the world could use a bit of coming back from where we are now. We had better work together at a second chance and take a different, more inclusive direction or it will be the end for us all. Messenger took eight years to complete, but the material comes from a span of 15. When I say material, I mean events from which I squeezed, begged, worried, created a fictionalized accounting of what happens on any given day. Today, I spoke to an inmate about heart. We speculated on what that meant, how you obtain it, and the labor required in keeping it. He said some good things to me that made a lot of sense. He listened intently and shook my hand. He then tried to walk off with my pen and some paper clips. After I recovered pen and paper clips, I helped him begin an essay on why basketball is such a terrific sport. I could have written him up, most staff would have. Eventually guys come around. The phrase come around becomes an enormous, an enormous chunk of your life. You must have the patience needed to watch iron rust. You have to wait for grown men to grow up. Then, and only then, you will have success in your classroom. So many, so much, so few. Foremost in your mind should be a fact stated by Officer Betty Amy. If you remove the administration, nothing happens. If you remove education staff, nothing happens. If you remove the officers, there will be dead people on the floors. This is teaching in a prison. Uh, I thought I'd speak a little bit about the ins and outs of self-publishing and uh, uh, relate to you my, my experience. To begin, uh, I tried to get my stories published in magazines and things and collected a handful of rejection slips like anybody, I guess. But uh, a friend told me that her daughter was a poet and she had just been published, self-published, that is, through Amazon. And I thought, if she can do it, uh, I think I, I'd like to try that. So what I did was I, I, I got on the, uh, their site and uh, self-publishing Amazon and it comes right up. And if you have the savvy, uh, if you're computer literate, which I'm really not at this point, uh, you can, it, it'll take you through the whole process and, uh, and, and, and you'll, you'll, you will get your, your book published. I went through, uh, I hired somebody to do it for me. And uh, from a flash drive, I, I, I had all my stuff on a flash drive. I gave her the flash drive and then we communicated back and forth. Uh, 
uh, during the uh, uh, process. Uh, and, and the way Amazon works this is it doesn't cost you anything. Uh, it, it, what they do is they make their money if they sell a book and it's all print on demand. So there's no warehouse. There's no, if you uh, go through the hoops and if you're okay, you're, you're, you're published, somebody can buy a book anytime they want. And, uh, uh, and that's the way they, it, it actually doesn't cost anything. Uh, the other thing is when you, uh, uh, you can make changes, you can change anything you would like at any time. Again, if you're literate enough, computer literate enough to do that. So uh, even in my latest book, uh, Messenger's Tattoo, uh, there, there are some typos and a few spacing issues, which I missed. The other, which is a good lesson because in the, in the sense that when you self-publish something and if you are your own editor, like, I was, you, you always miss something and what you, you don't want to embarrass yourself with dopey things you, you, you left out or that, you know, uh, obvious errors, you know, because number one, it's rude to the reader. It's like having somebody walk in front of the TV set when you're watching a good movie. And the other thing is as a writer, it does my ego a little bit says, how, how did I miss that? But uh, so I would say uh, uh, edit, 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 and bamboozle someone else into doing it with you or for you. Do that and, and correct that stuff before you send it off on its way. Or after you get the, your first one published and you notice it, you can do it then. Yeah, again, if you're literate enough. Uh, and the other thing is they have a, uh, they have like a writer's page that you, that, that you can, uh, where, 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 the, where the author can, tell readers a little bit about his life, his philosophy on fiction or, or writing uh, uh, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, oh, and you can name your own price. You, 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 you come up with the, the uh, price and then Amazon charges for each book uh, printed, they take their costs, what it costs them, and then they give you the uh, rest. Uh, well, actually a little more than what it costs them because otherwise they wouldn't be making any money. Oh, and they do have an author's price that you can buy. For example, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, Messenger's Tattoo is costs 15 bucks plus shipping. Uh, I can, I, as the author, I can get a copy much cheaper. And, and, then you, and then you can sell them to anybody you would like. Uh, and you do get a, uh, you, you do get a uh, ISBN number, which makes it possible for you to donate books to the library, which I would highly recommend because if you want an audience, I can't think of much of a much better way to do it. Donating your books uh, uh, to uh, libraries. Uh, as far as marketing the thing, Amazon does have programs that you can uh, uh, purchase and, and, and they will help you uh, uh, place these books, I guess in bookstores or whatever have you. I didn't get into that because again, I didn't, I didn't know how to jump through all the hoops to uh, uh, get, uh, but, but I've been selling my books. I, uh, uh, I, when I ride my motorcycle around, I have a couple of copies in my saddlebags. And if I, if I pull in at a rest stop and if I see some, someone who looks reasonably sane, I will, I will approach them and ask them if they want to buy a book. And I've sold a couple that way. It's, it's kind of fun, but, uh, for a writer like me, uh, I didn't start writing to get rich. Uh, I, I, you know, I just wanted an audience, you know, get my message out there about uh, teaching in a prison, you know. So, uh, but you're you're kind of free to market it, however, uh, well, whatever deal you can work out with Amazon. They, like I say, they they do have uh, uh, a platform uh, platforms that you can purchase, and and they will help you with that. I I also have another book. Uh, available on Amazon.com called the uh, Pink Trout and Other Stories. Basically the same kind of style, very short, kind of uh, out there a little bit. Uh, 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 people have, fr friends have read it and they say, well, it really makes you think. Well, you know, I guess that's what all writers want to do uh, a little bit anyway. Uh, I, I was going to go trout fishing on... Uh, in, in November, if you, if you get in the rivers up north that are connected to Lake Michigan, there's big honking trout that go up there. And you get in there with waders and you with a spinning reel and you cast and you can catch these beautiful 
fish, you know. And I wanted, I hadn't gone in, in a couple of years and I wanted to test out my equipment. You know, my waiters, if they leaked and, and I thought, well, I'm not going to cast a, just the empty sinker. I'll put on a, so I put on a, 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 a Rapala a, a, on it, a minnow, a fake minnow, you know, artificial. And on a, like, like this, I thought, oh, what do I got, a snag? And here I, here I got this muskie. <laughs> and my kid was there. And he just, you know, because uh, he was very impressed with that. You know, I, I released it, but uh, he, my kid took the picture of it. But it was just a, just outhouse luck. Uh, you, you design your own cover, too. Uh, and if you get on the Amazon site uh, and navigate through there a little bit, it, it will ask you questions and give you uh, choices, uh, you know, what you want to do with your cover. For example, this this cover on the pink trout was, and other stories. Uh, uh, th this was my friend Ron, uh, Ron, and this is Lake Michigan, and he's actually holding a carp. But we took this photograph, and I thought it would make kind of a neat cover, and my and my friend got a uh, kind of a charge out of it too, and I wasn't even sure of the title when I went to this woman uh, to to who's who's helping me out. And uh, all of a sudden, she on her she was looking for images of trout, and this pink one came up, and I and I do have a story in here called the pink trout, well, uh, and title, uh, and uh, and and I said, well, let's call it the pink trout. Sounds good to me, and that's how that went. And then she asked me how much, and I said, because uh, it asked you, what do you want to charge for your book? Amazon will, and and I said, ah, ten bucks. No, make it twelve. Uh, greed, you know, he's gonna, you know, just kind of. You know, so anyway, so it's all up to you, the a writer, to decide all these things. You can find my book, Messengers, Tattoo, and Other Stories on Amazon.com. I hope you enjoyed this presentation, and thank you for watching and listening.